He feeds our mind, body, and soul. The intellect, represented here. Cause and effect. Everything begins with choice. Hey, Kierkegaard said, every duty is essentially duty to God. Plato's Symposium. This yours? Wonderful. I'm, I'm so happy to be back with, with both of you. Um, and I, I thought I would start first. Maybe we just share something. I, I've I don't know, Eric, have you been watching much of John's uh, new series? I know it's like a monumental task to keep up with this. I have been over keeping here. up with it. <laughs> cool. I have been keeping up with it. Yeah, That's I'm loving it. Uh, the discussions, the recent discussions on Kierkegaard have been really interesting. I love the stuff on irony. Um, yeah, it reminded me of a comment my wife made at one point. that was just the most profound thing I'd really ever heard in an aphorism, which was like, like every moment in life has severity and flippancy and that's that that irony that you're talking about i really love it yeah 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 cool well i i asked because I, I wanted to follow some of the themes and, and just kind of we could all share some something that we thought was kind of ironic or made us rethink how we were looking at the world and kind of like an a poor it could be very small irony it doesn't have to be some kind of like systemic insight that you're you're having um but just something like like that 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 maybe you experienced and i always go first so i'll I'll go last this time just to kind of not lead the question as much so eric maybe you want to share something yeah sure um i was sort of reflecting on our previous conversations and for the first conversation um i didn't really know what to expect i had started the awakening from the meaning crisis series and uh, i didn't understand your work really so i kind of approached it with this like relatively empty mind ready to be filled and then for the second uh discussion i you know had binged a lot of your content and read your papers and realized the significance of what you're doing and so i felt this like urgent need to offer you up something so i took the whole week off work oh, and my. oh no <laughs> you no know, i did oh. leading up to it and um but ultimately, I think the first discussion uh, got closer to that real uh, dialogos. So that's an irony. And I guess maybe I shouldn't be taking weeks off work to, you know, offer up some intellectual tidbit. Well, I want to go back to not right now. I mean, I want to go back and watch both again. Uh, I, I actually found the second one uh, really good. I thought it was very provocative. There was a lot of insight that I garnered from it. Uh, so I really appreciated that. For me, uh, within my practices, um, the almost has been coming up, almost this and almost that. Um, and I've often struggled against that and found it frustra frustrating, the almost. Um, but in in some of the inner work I've been doing, the di inner dialogical work and other, the almost is perhaps optimal. This is the irony that's coming out for me in that allows one to get close enough. It's kind of an analogous to serious play. It allows one to get close enough to make perhaps some influential moves and redirect things without getting too close that one gets consumed uh, and corrupted. And uh, so I thought uh, there's been this reframing for me of the almost uh, as something that I shouldn't be seeing so negatively, but I should be seeing as positively so there was there was a, a, an ironic realization for me there hmm. yeah, those were so awesome both examples i really just want to savor them for a moment because uh yeah the that that insight you were saying too john i think is uh really profound because because the the Jungian aspirational model doesn't othering is really important right because you don't actually have to make contact with things you just have to give them a space for communication so that's really cool that like that the humility uh that you were experiencing in that or, or that that kind of moment and i've just been finding ai amazing that's kind of my my recent uh metanoia and, and appreciation and and kind of i've probably learned about dozens and dozens of ai tools over the last week or so and it's just like this serious play that I was so playing with all these different AI technologies that it started to kind of permeate how I was looking at the world and the world opened up and I go, wow, all this wonder in this domain really kind of opened up 
into like, wow, that's so cool that I'm living in this wild time that, that, you know, that the tales are going to expand so radically on what humans can do creativity creatively. And it was just so cool to see the AI voices getting better and how people are generating video from text and just all these things, which is, I know it's a very technical kind of thing, but, but it was very playful and, and fun to, to kind of see. Um, so, so that was a good share. Um, and then maybe we'll just do one more round of, of uh, just anything that's been philosophically valuable to you in the last few weeks. It's like, oh, cool. We're three people wondering about things. Uh, again, Eric, if you want to go first or if you don't want to, it's totally fine as well. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm trying to think, is there any new philosophical insight? Um, you know, I'm always obsessed with philosophical arguments. Um, so I'm sure there's been a few that have run through my mind. I guess, really, it's mostly um, this issue of relevance realization um, and predictive processing that I've been thinking about just in the last couple of days. And um, I'm curious, this is just turning into a question. I always have questions for John. So, um, but that's what's in, in my mind. So, philosophically speaking, the question is, you know, I've heard John mention there are moments when we kind of let go of that pursuit of relevance. And that's almost like a more sublime experience. And and yet then in the predictive processing paper, um, you talk about like, there's a kind of, um, you know, like Tai Chi between autism and schizophrenia that we have to yeah. balance. And I love the the imagery there and just imagining like that, that balancing act that we're constantly going through. And I wonder, you know, and I don't know how to make sense of it. You know, how, how does that jive this balance that we have to strike with that kind of more sublime, you know, release from the process? And is it also part of the balance or is this like a, a meta balancing at on another axis? So, um, uh, what's what, what's the etiquette here? Should we first continue around the circle and then come back? Let's to that let's follow Eric. I think that was he seems really passionate and excited about this question. So let's follow. I think the I was just the talking. Eros. I was just talking to Brendan about this. Um, yeah. So first of all, I want to be very careful about what that proposal is. Um, I, I don't think it, it, you misrepresented it at all, Eric. I just want to unpack it um, uh, so that we might have the. The, the best possible set of tools we're we're talking about uh, sort of things at the threshold of intelligibility so it's very tricky but it's very germane to the whole platonic neoplatonic tradition and, and other traditions like zen um uh so first of all the proposal is that um uh, relevance realization and predictive pro so the, first of all let's just for people who are just listening the idea is um let's take the predictive processing framework carl friston andy clark and especially a student that Andy and I shared, Mark Miller, who's now working with me, um, who is both one of the best people I know in my life and also titanically brilliant. And he he is already superseding me and I'm very proud of him. And, and I hope that's not in a condescending way. I genuinely am very proud of Mark. Um, and then of course the work, uh, Brett Anderson is out there, just uh, follow him and follow his Substack. He's just generating all this amazing stuff. So here's the basic idea though. Um, in predictive processing, uh, there's two meta problems you're facing. Uh, sorry, not in predictive processing. Being a cognitive agent, you're facing two meta problems. One is I want to anticipate the world rather than react to it, because if I can avoid the tiger, that's much better than wrestling with the tiger. Um, and then the other one is, well, that problem I've been obsessed with, relevance realization. Um, and then what we tried to show is it turns out that the if you put these two together, they sort of mutually solve each other. And the, and the predictive processing idea is um, the, 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 main, there's, the main insight is don't try to predict the world, try to predict yourself. And as you get really better at predicting yourself, you end up predicting the world well. So what does that mean? You have the, the sort of sensory motor part of the brain are interacting with the world and they're generating all kinds of patterns. And then you have a layer above that, right? Um, that is trying to predictively complete uh, that pattern. Um, and, and it, and it can get error feedback from the, from the lower part of the brain, clear error feedback. No, that's wrong. That's in a way, the world doesn't give you clear error feedback. 
right? And then you you stack these layers on top of each other and you get this massively recursive process of predicting yourself at various levels of resolution from very sort of momentary concrete to very abstract. And then the idea is error is flowing up and uh, imaginal prediction is flowing down. Um, and that's how you uh, you get to really anticipate the world at many different scales. Now, the problem with predictive processing is there's an issue in there about what's called precision weighting. You you There's a lot of signal you want to just ignore because it's, well, irrelevant. It's task irrelevant, et cetera. Um, so what we propose is the following. If you let predictive processing sort of self-organize and you put in a, sort of a process by which it does precision weighting, that's how it's sort of paying attention. What happens is the predictive processing starts to self-organize to find trade-off relationships um, in reality, uh, like between generalizing and discriminating, between bias and variance. I won't go into all of them, but it finds these trade-off relationships and it sort of capitalizes on them uh, by, by giving opponent processing. And then the opponent processing starts to do the relevance realization and the predict in the precision weighting. And so the whole system starts to anticipate in a relevant realizing, relevance realizing manner, um, and then does relevance realizing in an anticipatory manner. I just wanted to lay that out because if we just start talking about it, I think a lot of people would go, what the hell are they talking about? Uh, first of all, did that just sort of land as a, as a proposal? Uh, um, I, I, sorry, as an exposition. That was very helpful. Yes, thank you. And, and so, and then of course, once you get that, you get some advantages because you can you get a, a way to theoretically glue predictive processing into embodiment because relevance realization is always relevance to autopoiesis. And that helps you deal with a lot of criticisms of predictive processing that it sort of floats free. And it's kind of like a panpsychist, pan-semanticist weirdness, uh, like two clocks that get entrained to each other, like on a shelf would be cognitive under this definition. and. Uh, and so uh, the, the theories help each other. Uh, the analogy I use is predictive processing is like Mendelian genetics and relevance realization is like Darwinian selection. And when you put them together, you get the grand synthesis. Um, so that being said, now to move to the more, um, I think I'm going to use this word because it's right in this context, the, the mystical proposal. Um, and this actually came up when I was in, in conversation with Buddhist monks, uh, which was kind of interesting. Um, and I sort of had the realization a, in discussion, it was a very much a dialo dialo dialogical realization. And I said, well, the relevance, relevance realization is intrinsically interested in itself because it's a, a self-correcting evolving thing. And insight is the, I think, incontrovertible proof that we relevance realization is recursively interested in itself in this way. Um, but one of the things it can realize is that the process of relevance realization itself can ultimately be irrelevant. Um, and then what that, when, why, when might that be the case? And this is the idea that when you're not trying to be in relationship to beings, but to the ground of being itself, um, then you have to let go. And then what you're doing is basically your your the 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 principle the wanting within relevance realization and the wanting within reality then enter into resonance with each other um, um and it's a proposal for trying to understand non-duality and what's going on there um the problem that well, not the problem well maybe it's a problem i, I don't want to put words into eric's mouth the, the thing is yes but predictive processing you're always doing this balancing between overfitting and underfitting Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so here's what I'm going to say. That's the predictive processing side of the relevance realization side. When I'm when I'm in resonance with the ground of being itself, the issue of overfitting or underfitting disappears. Because there is no overfitting or underfitting. That is to properly misrepresent the ground of being, right? Because there is, the ground of being is no thing, right? Uh, it's a nothingness. Um, and, and, you know, and this is a, um, this doesn't necessarily even have to be a Heideggerian reading. Uh, you know, this is a Zen reading. There's lots of ways in which the Neoplatonic one is understood this way. And so the balancing act, which is an optimal grip in which you're trying to get the, the 
environmentally dependent because these decisions are always environmentally dependent. Um, and so notice that. I'm trying to balance between overfitting and underfitting. That's the main thing, right? Sorry, some can you hear that? Somebody's cutting the lawn outside. Is, is no. that bad? Okay. No. Okay. So you're trying to get the balance between overfitting and underfitting, and you're optimally gripping, but you can't decide that a priori because it's depend what what is the best depends on the environment you're in. And this goes to a paper that Anna Riedel and I are, are trying to get published. But when you're not in any environment, but in the encompassing ground of all possible environments, that problem falls away for you. And that you're just, you're, right, um, you're not doing the balance anymore. You are, right, you, there is no overfitting, underfitting concern. Um, and I take it that this is kind of what is meant. I don't, I don't think this is a forced reading. Uh, but you know that the Tao is behind the yin and the yang, and even the ba the mm -hmm. balance between them. It's it's actually the the encompassing behind them, kind of thing. Um, so that would be my initial answer to you, Eric. That's great. Yeah, I, I was also wondering in this balance whether it's desirable to employ a kind of barbelling strategy. Um, Nassim Taleb talking about like investing strategies says you really want to like minimize your downside and maximize your upside and don't really worry about the intermediary states. Mm. So, you know, that barbell shape. Now, if we have that underfitting and overfitting, um, you know, schizophrenia and autism, do we want to barbell those two strategies so that we can kind of have the best of both worlds? Um, and will that allow for this um, kind of subsiding into the background and the ground of cognition. I would imagine that it wouldn't, but at the same time, I would imagine that a barbelling strategy would have like adaptive advantages. Yeah. Uh, and so this goes towards a, a proposal and it's a theoretical proposal that Leo Ferraro and I made when we published the first paper on uh, a mindfulness. I've, you know, I, I followed it up with a, a paper with Enric Repetti's um, philosophy of meditation. And then there's one I've also submitted for an anthology that uh, Brian Ostefan is putting together. Uh, and they sort of form a trilogy. So I might get confused in my reference. Uh, so I'm asking for forgiveness around that because the three sort of like in my mind. Um, so, but the idea is there is something like the barbelling strategy, but it's, it, but it's within a, a, a dynamics of opponent processing. Um, and so, you get a meditative tradition in which you're 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 driving very down you're driving right down right um and then right and and, and you in 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 a, in a very powerful sense you're becoming sort of super autistic right and then there's the contemplative strategy in which you're driving out and you're 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 you're, you're becoming you know uh super schizotypical right right mm -hmm. um but you you have them acting as correction on each other because you're constantly flowing between them and opponent processing. And the idea is, and this is what the traditions speak to, and this is also what I've found in practice, is that when you practice this alternating um, opponent processing, you have two things. One thing is you sort of increase the flexibility of this you increase the flexibility of your attentional scaling where the flexibility is measured by what's the range you can go to, how readily can you get out of an attractor state to other states? How long can you in like can you keep the alternation going? Things like this, measures of flexibility. So it does that. And that just I I I I claim, it's like a prediction, that um this enhances just your day-to-day -day optimal gripping. It sort of improves your meta-optimal gripping. But, and, and that's valuable for wisdom, right? But it also does this other thing, which is when you do this, you, right? First, first you, like you're doing like a prajna practice, out, you do, you inhale and you go as contemplatively out as you can. And then you exhale and you go as meditatively in. And first you're just doing this, you're alternating. And then you're starting to do them in parallel, right? And then what happens is, it's all at once. It's it's deep in and deep, you get the non-duality, the prajna, uh, which isn't which isn't homogeneous. It's the world in a grain of sand, and every grain in, goes into the world. It's it's that William Blake kind of 
thing, the scantia intuitiva. Um, and so I think the that combination of what you might call everyday uh, improvement of optimal gripping and mystical access to the this this what we've just been talking about where you let go is actually sort of meta optimal for us um, in in a very powerful way because I think the ability to let go opens up a space in which the flexibility can stretch if you'll allow me to play with that metaphor more without with uh, and, and then the optimal gripping also. Um, tends to get you, um, it tends to enhance the relevance realization machinery. Because the idea is the better the relevance realization machinery is enhanced, the better it is at realizing when it itself is irrelevant. It's a kind of a platonic argument. Right. Did that, sorry, that was a long answer. Yeah, yeah I can't say I 100% followed everything in there but i definitely got the gist of it so good, um good. i wish i could follow better but um now have you made the association between um this kind of uh, autistic and schizophrenic uh, method and the monad and the indefinite dyad in pythagoreanism have you thought about okay because i've oh. i've heard others talk about autism as like an extreme masculine brain yes. structure and then yes, schizophrenia yes. extreme feminine and the monad is the principle of the masculine and the indefinite dyad oh. is the principle of ah. the feminine yeah, and of yeah, course yeah. the monad is that limiting um kind of yeah. you know centrifugal and self-enclosed the... yes very much yes 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 right yeah right so this kind of ties in also to what i've really been wanting to talk to you about from uh, our first conversation, which is, you know, your conception of naturalism, the naturalistic imperative in cognitive science right. and an activism. And I believe there's real value in that, but also, you know, relevance realization seems to be taking place downstream of the monad and the indefinite dyad. Right. And for me, I like, it just, I have an intuition that cognition must have its root deeper than that in the one itself. And any activity of cognition certainly will involve the monad and indefinite dyad, any intelligibility, anything that we'll, yep, we're going to encounter yep. here. Yep. But the one, it, I feel like I I don't know how you include that in a naturalistic conception. Oh, also, no. Excellent. Excellent. I just gave a talk about this at the Consilience Conference about this and about uh, how, how, we, how, how can we have tr strong transcendence, which is transcendence that's, that's not just psychological improvement, but has real epistemic and ontological import, um, and therefore would ground his spirituality the way Neoplata Neoplatonism grounds his spirituality. And how could you do that within a naturalistic, like, what would it be? And one of the arguments I made, and I've been developing, but I made it, um, I made it at Ralston, but I made it better, I think, um, at least the feedback seems to agree with me, at uh, the consilience uh, talk is that I talk about extended naturalism and I talk about um, the idea that naturalism is not only that which is uh, inferentially derivable from our sciences, but that which is uh, um, presupposed by our sciences. And then that, then that gets you, so I call this extended naturalism. And then when you talk about that, um, uh, and then you 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 get a real um, le leveled ontology, real emergence, real emanation, and I argued for that, and then a real conformity re kind of knowing, and I argued for that. You put those together, and you get strong transcendence within extended naturalism. So I I think very I think you're right. I don't have any. I agree with you, and I've been trying to get the idea. So I mean, I still teach the naturalistic imperative in cognitive science to. Uh, introductory cog sci because people are being ushered into a scientific worldview um, and that's proper but I think any account of cognition has to go has to rely on an extended naturalism in the way I've just articulated it, it, like we have to get we have to get an account of um, intelligibility and uh, the 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 interpenetration of intelligibility and being, you know, that Hegel is wrestling with and Plato is wrestling with, et cetera. Yes, into any deep account, I think, of uh, of human cognition. So yeah, I think, my, mm. I, I hope you take it. My answer is a yes, 
I totally agree with that, uh, and that we've got to unfold that. Um, I, I and um, I don't phrase it quite the way you do, but I'm very interested in because I was talking to Brendan about this about what do we do when we're and you, you can see physics bumping into an analogous problem right with you know, ideas of the singularity is like how do we get something that is simultaneously the source of unity and difference and yet it, it is bound in some original uh you know all the words are wrong simplicity some original one um yeah uh, yeah totally yeah yes hmm. and I'm, I'm trying to respond to it and that's how i'm trying to respond to it <laughs> Okay, it, that that also relates to something I heard you talking about with regard to like the, I guess, extended nature of of cognition and mind, and I forget honestly exactly which conversation this was. It might have been with Rick Rapetti, um, but it, it was uh, this notion that there isn't a monadic self that like yes. fundamentally there is this interplay like just you can't eliminate that multiplicity and i think that you can't eliminate the multiplicity but also at the same time i feel like for for some basic kind of philosophical reasons you do need the monad in the self at some level like for for leibniz you know what what distinguishes us from mechanism what distinguishes us from like component parts interacting is that I mean, there is this kind of integral unity and that's why he feels the need to put forward you know our, our being a monad and reflecting the other being so there isn't an implicit and inherent multiplicity in us but without that oneness um i've found it difficult to imagine how you know like with leibniz's mill the thought experiment you walk into the mill uh which is supposed to be like a, a conscious agent and you see the parts interacting but like okay where's the oneness that i experience in myself in this you know so it, I feel I feel that the the self has to be grounded at, at some level in a, a henad, you know, a unity of some kind. Call it a monad or not. Do you um, was I getting you wrong before when you said that there's like no monadic aspect to the self, or it's just not a pure monad? So I mean, I think of the self um, and the mind. Uh, so there's life, mind, self, and I think of them as deep continuity. And I think of life as autopoetic, um, and it is a unity, but is a, it is a unity that in which you get this weird thing that there is the generation of norms or standard to which the organism then binds itself. So there is, right? There is a going out and a returning back. There's a there's an aspect of self transcendence that's built into life at its fundamental that is not a contradiction to the fact that it is an auto. In fact. It is integral to it being an autopoietic thing because you have to be, uh, you know, it has to be a dialogical thing in some sense in order for it to be autopoietic. And so I think of the self that way too. I think the self is a self-making thing. In fact, the reason why I I, I, I want to emphasize, and Rick and I are working on a paper about this, um, the autopoietic dialogical nature of the self is precisely in order to, in order to be able to overcome um, the paradox of self-transcendence as posed by Strassen. I mean, a monadic self can't self-transcend. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, a mad so if it just if it if it just extends itself, that's not self-transcendence because it doesn't have the requisite otherness. Um, if something other than it breaks in, that's not it's transcendence, but it's not self-transcendence. And then Strassen argues. Therefore, self-transcendence, self-creation are impossible. And this feels like Kant's argument that there can never be a science of biology. It's like, yeah, but life is exactly that kind of thing, um, Galen Strassen. And so your model, the presupposition under it, namely that there's something ultimately monadic about the self, is the one that we have to give up. So that would be my response. Hmm. What about a Leibnizian monad that is ex itself extended in the sense that everything that we interact with, all of our relationships through, you know, the analyticity of identity or, or rather analyticity of predication for Leibniz, all of those relationships are in us, essentially. They are part and parcel of that monad. So because it contains that multiplicity, you can kind of transcend the current state of that self by adjusting the levels you know of of the relations that you're partaking of and the the intensity that they have for you 
at that moment. So it sounds to me like all you're doing then is stretching out the dialogical between one instance of the self and another instance of it. And then it's no longer self-enclosed, it's self-transcending in a very powerful way. Because what you invoked was, right? Because if it's just static, like the, the, the uh, what, uh, they see everything, but they have no windows, who would, I forget who said that about Leibniz's monads, right? Um, uh, um, then the the problem is you get an absolutely static thing, which of course can't be what affords self transcendence. And what you introduce then is you introduce a historical dimension, and then you're making it temporally non monadic in order to get the self transcendence in. Right. It's like the Neoplatonic saying, like everything is in everything, but appropriately in each. And so the self transcendence wouldn't be fundamentally swapping out any stuff, you would just be kind of adjusting and attuning the levels of awareness of, you know, what's involved. But that monad is a kind of necessarily fixed thing, because it's that which allows these multiple relations to come into um, their interaction. I, I mean, maybe, I mean, to me, that would be sort of equating the self to, um, sort of the normative structures that bind the self together. And I think that's a necessary but insufficient account of the self. I think the self has to be able to, I, I think the self is an entity, and this is Kierkegaard, right? The self is an entity that is properly always in relationship to itself. Um, and that, uh, and so I wanna be able to, I, I'm trying to say to you that I think the principle of differentiation is just as important to a self as the principle of integration. Um, and then a self is a, is a self-complexifying thing. And, and of course, complexification is how you can explain emergence and transcendence. And for me, again, I think that's a much more dialogical model than a monadic model. Okay. I, and I get that. But, it, you know, I've heard you say before that the emanation and the emergence have to completely in, interpenetrate, interpenetrate and yes. be like on a par with one another. Um, like following Erigina. And, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about that ultimately, because I do get this sense. And, you know, when I read Proclus, he reinforces these ideas that the monad does have a kind of preeminence over the indefinite dyad. And in the one, there is one and many, as um, Damascius says, you know, it's not That's simply good. a one. And yet there is the preeminence of the one. That's why we call it one. Right. Um, so, yes, I, I think the self has to be um, inherently dialogical, just like in some sense, the one itself has to be dialogical. But I, I don't know if you can put the oneness on a par with the multiplicity. I feel like th there is a kind of logical priority to unity. I mean, just with numbers, like in order to reach multiplicity first, you, ha you have to get through unity and unity. Like, uh, but see, the whole point is implied. Uh... A lot of the recent, you know, this is where I think Derrida is strong in the postmodernist is to emphasize how much difference is also irremovably essential to intelligibility. And so if the one is the source of intelligibility and not just the source of sort of mathematical unity, um, the one has to be equally the source of uh, integration and differentiation. Uh, if it's the source of intelligibility, because if I remove all difference, I lose information, for example, I lose all information, and I just get homogeneous non intelligibility. Um, and that, I don't think that's what they want to talk about. Um, I, I don't I don't know what to, I, I'm not quite sure what the preeminence, what your intuition of preeminence is. And I'm not I'm not trying to mm -hmm. bully you at all. I'm, I'm I, I, like, I like, I, I, I see the oneness in the quantum realm and the oneness from the oneness from the bottom, the ground, and the oneness of the canopy from of 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 you know uh, at the cosmological level uh, as um, deeply uh, deeply one. I mean, and, and that's what's driving the current physics. There's the deep intuition that these two, right, the oneness of entanglement and the oneness uh, of space time somehow belong together. Um, and I think that's right. And I think trying to prioritize one over the other, because th what the physicists are doing, they have exactly the opposite intuition of you. They say, no, 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 the bottom, right? The bottom is the real, and and, and it should be given preeminence in our explanation. And so I like mm -hmm. when I look at these two, two sets of 
it, uh, it, and I mean this in a, a positive sense, not a dismissive sense. When I look at these two sets of philosophical intuitions, they seem exactly symmetrical to me. And I can't come up with an argument for why one is better than the other. Because whatever you say about this, I just invert it and say this This is the other one has the complementary strength. So th I, I do this elsewhere at, at greater length. So I'm just run through quickly. I have this symmetry argument exactly like between these two. Uh, and, and I think the reason why I, I'm not a physicist, but I, I do study problem solving and they're not solving this problem and they haven't been solving it for 50 years. And so when you're not solving a problem, you need to step back and look at a presupposition that you're not changing across all your theorizing. And one of the presuppositions is the fundamentality of the bottom. And I think that's what's actually thwarting them. They need a properly mm. uh, symmetrical solution to how to bring about the integration. That's my response. Now that right. I agree and with you, that that's not that's not in Proclus. It's certainly not in no. Plotinus. I would make a case that I think it's properly in Erigena. And I think it's because Erigena has the, a Trinitarian notion behind him that it, it, he can sort of get them uh, being uh, of equal ontological status. Right. The preeminence for me comes from the idea that there is a procession outward into multiplicity. And yes, the one is equally the cause of the multiplicity, but as you're moving away from the one, you're moving away from the good. And so teleologically, the return, the reversion back to the one is to be preferred, is to be kind of held up as superior in some sense than the descent into multiplicity. Um, this, similar to how in the Theotetus, uh, Plato says that God is the cause of all good things, right? Not necessarily all things because so much of our experience here deals with falsehood and illusion which we talked about last time and i really liked what we had to say last time about that um but yeah it's like there's something about this lower realm uh closer to the bottom that has a lesser degree of reality and that's why like plotinus and proclus both um treat matter as in some sense predatory plotinus treats it more as an arche of uh or principle of evil yeah. you know following like the way that socrates is talking in the phaedo mm -hmm. um and i think that's a, a mistake and he's taking socrates a little bit too seriously you can never take socrates too seriously it's the danger of hermeneutics there um but proclus you know says that there is no rk strictly speaking with regard to matter or evil it is this kind of pure privation and i feel like there's a need for that concept in order to make sense of falsehood and make sense of apparent evil and make sense of all the incongruity and lack of oneness that we observe. And so for me, that, and for, I think for the Neoplatonists, that is on the bottom of the ontological hierarchy. And so there is this real difference, you know, there's an asymmetry between the bottom and the top. There's an emanation out to this receptacle um, matter and then there's the reversion back to the source, and the source is to be pre uh, preferred. Okay, so I'll reply to that. Um, and, and first of all, I think for er like Erigena, the, the the four ways in which God is God, God is also not just the top. He's also the bottom. Um, he's the nothingness, the no-thingness that makes everything uh, 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 possible. Um, and I think what you see in Erigena, and this is one of the things that... Um, I see the Kyoto school criticizing Neoplatonism for is you get uh, the idea that what we, we have to hold actuality and possibility as equally real. Um, and so I can do the exact reverse. I can say, so the Zen tradition will come to you and say, what's most real is the suchness, the absolute unique, you know, specification suchness of this and how it all fits into everything else that's, you know, you're losing touch with what is most real because you've lost touch uh, with it. And what's underneath the suchness is the luminous void, is the pure, uh, is, is a kind of pure potentiality, which is very similar to, you know, certain ways in which people understand the quantum uh, domain. And so now, and now what do we do? We, and I want to say, because if I lose that, uh, you know, I lose also something that I find supremely valuable, which is the suchness of 
and it's also ineffable. It's also non-categorical, right? And, and and that I mean, the suchness really matters. That the, Solaris brought that out, right? Uh, right, the Solaris paradox. Here's individual. You know, do you know the story, right? You're mm -hmm. on the, the the you're on the planet that's the Stanislaw Lem is one of the great uh, philosophical sci-fi, and the, and the idea is. The ocean, they and people are trying to communicate with the ocean, and they can't. They can tell it's intelligent, but they can't. So they send a, a, a they send these people here to actually live, like, and the ocean generates absolute doppelgangers of people they used to know. More like absolute. So the paradox is these people. So let's take our hero. There was here's this woman he was deeply in love with. He's lost the woman to death. The ocean generates somebody that has all of the properties. Right, all of the categorical properties of the woman. Shouldn't he love her? Well, no, he has exactly the opposite. He is horrified by this. Right. So and he feels part of himself being drawn to her because she is identical, but he's also repulsed because it doesn't have that suchness of that particular person, that historical, irreplaceable, in time and space suchness. And that hmm. matters to us too. And that's a nut that that is equally a touchstone of realness for us. I mean, what I'm ultimately trying to do, and this is what the next series is about, is I want to put Zen, which is the great synthesis of the East, Buddhism and Taoism, and Neoplatonism, the great synthesis of the West, into a deep dialogical relationship with each other. That's what the new series is about, because they they often have these inverted, complementary senses of what's real and what's good, um, and... Um, mm. And we, we have reason to believe that this is a dual project. The Kyoto School, of course, had a lot of good to say about this. Thomas Plant is doing it in his book, you know, where he's trying to put uh, Dionysian Neoplatonism into discussion with Buddhism. Um, and so that's my that's my answer. Uh, again, I, I'll just keep going back that I can make moves where I can say, yes, th this gives you that. Uh, but this also gives you all right, the opposite. And you also think of that as a touchstone of real. Uh, there, so there's there's something, and and you know, object oriented ontology has really been wrestling with this too. It's like, and they talk about you don't want to undermine and you don't want to overmine, uh, right? And and mm -hmm. and and trying to get that balance. And I think the way we can do that is we can, I think Neoplatonism tends to overmine when it goes wrong, and I think Zen tends to undermine uh, when it gets wrong. It tends to lose the reality of the systems and the gestalts. Right, and if we could put them into a deep dialogue, I think we could actually optimally grip between the two. And I think that's the best way of getting at uh, the real. Uh, and I think there's something right about. I think it's Nishitani in Religion and Nothingness who says we need a position in which uh, actuality and possibility are equally real for us if we're going to break out a lot of these straitjackets. I, I just wanted to wrap series for 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I think to like what you're saying is really clever, John. I used to think you were kind of insane because I would meet every week. <laughs> I would meet every week with, with like Daniel Zaruba and all these brilliant kind of Platonists. And also they have like a really strong meditative practice. And I'm seeing like all of this contemplative beauty of Platonism. And then I've done a decent bit of Zen practice. And I kind of get what you were talking about when you were talking about like the Zen aspect. And like Zen is so in, in invested in the spontaneity of like kind of the material and, yeah. and the Neoplatonic is in like the integration of the conceptual or something, or like the imaginal or something yes. like that. Yeah. And, and I was like, this guy, John Verveke, like he's very smart, but this is something he's probably wrong at. And I kept sticking with it because you say it and now you say it even more, but I mean, even like, you know, eight months ago, you were, you were saying it a little bit and it's like, oh yeah, I kind of get, cause they're like these two engines. They're these two awesome kind of traditions that are these engines and when you put them together they're so powerful they 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 yeah. do for you participatorily uh so much and like tanabe eric if you're interested in he you can just get his book on metanoetics and just search like plotinus or plato and he says some really insightful things about plotinus because i love plotinus like blindly love plotinus <laughs> and then i'm like oh cool tanabe is giving some criticism that has a lot of merit. It's like, oh, okay, let me think about that and kind of have a, a dialectic with Tanabe's view of Plotinus versus kind of Plotinus's view of Plotinus. And you you learn so much. And it's like there's there's this 
richness between the traditions, the same way kind of the Kyoto school was was bridging all of this with Western Europe, the you know, they're they're also bridging with the ancient uh kind of Roman Gre Greco tradition. Yeah, they and are. It's so exciting. Like once you kind of can see it that way, it's like, oh, that's what John is so excited about and, and always talking about. Because they do, they're such opposite poles in really seemingly contrasting ways, but they do have a synergy. Yeah. And uh they like a, like a like a that heterogeneity of their system is like what makes it kind of cool when you start to yeah, combine I, it. I, I'm proposing that right from get go, we try and bring about something that has opponent processing written into its fundamental grammar, rather than something that it sort of finds as it unfolds. Yeah, and and we have to remember that like you know there's 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 been a long-standing tradition of Zen Christianity and Zen Catholicism that's also been and when you look what they're trying to merge with in the Christianity and the Catholicism are the are the Neoplatonic elements, um, and so. Like I, I, this is not completely de novo. This, and and Plant is doing it in his book, and he 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 makes arguments that it it, it was probably already hap it was happening, you know, uh, on the Silk Road um, in the past. Um, yeah. So yes, I'm excited about it too. And I, I re Eric, I realize this is somewhat promissory, uh, but that is the that is the project I'm 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 working on, and that's the argument I I, I use to justify the project. Well, yeah, I think I might be able to kind of reconcile the neoplatonic account with some closer to what you're talking about so the concept of matter obviously it only has kind of an apparent existence for proclus it is predatory okay. now uh plotinus in on the nature of matter uh i forget i think it's second ennead uh eighth tractate maybe no uh I forget which one, but uh, he talks about the intelligible matter, which yeah. is contrasted with the the kind of imminent physical matter in that the imminent physical matter is a principle of individuation and it's what separates things and different forms can occupy that matter and that kind of separates them in space. But the intelligible matter is actually a factor of uh, uniting for the forms because that matter uh, being closer to this divine source of the indefinite dyad contains all of that multiplicity in a unity, as is the case with everything in the realm of forms, that everything is much more concentrated there. Now, I have my own kind of, I have, I'll credit myself with one original philosophical insight that I haven't heard from anyone else, which is kind of a corollary to Leibniz's indiscernibility, um, or rather identity of indiscernibles. And it's the um indeterminateness of indifference that's the corollary to it so for leibniz if things share exactly the same properties they are one and the same thing it's kind of like plato seems to say the same thing as well i think of leibniz as like very much a neoplatonist um but uh yeah the the flip side of that is that if there's something in our experience related to our identity within our monad in Leibniz's sense that is indistinguishable from other possible substrates um like matter doesn't have definite formal content and Leibniz uh, actually disagrees with me in the point that I'm about to try to articulate for you um in that he says you know in the monadology if you keep zooming in to matter there's just more form there's just you're going to find yeah. planets and trees and rivers and like there's no end to it and i think that's that may be right but not in the way that leibniz thought in because i use this indefiniteness of indiscernibles concept where if from my perspective given the information i have access to i could not discern between the world in which like an atom in my finger had a planet uh with like aquatic environments or a planet that was a big desert you know tatooine world that's uh i can't make a, a difference between that and so it doesn't exist uh relative to me in either of those definite states and i think we have to say that if we accept what's going on in information theory and, and physics where we have an information mass energy correspondence. Mm -hmm. Because if we want to go with Leibniz and say that things are fully specified down to like an infinite degree of smallness, 
then that's infinite information. That's infinite specificity, ergo infinite energy mass, which clearly is not the case. Yes. So I, I think, think that argument's the correct argument. Yes, go, go. keep going. Yeah, so uh, I've I've tried to interpret the Neoplatonic notion of mundane matter in that perspective. It is a receptacle. It is in a way uh, apparent, but it it the way that it appears as a kind of pure potential masks like all of the reality that is really there in it. So just like the intelligible matter contains all possibility, mundane matter may actually contain not one specific configuration of really small worlds down there, but a, a kind of superposition of all the various configurations and structures we might find. Um, so that has a lot of implications um, that I've explored over the years, but it does kind of divinize matter in a way, not matter in its appearance, which as its appearance is uh, not quite a principle of evil, but it is that kind of a principle of separation that allows for misconception that allows for misapprehension falsehood yes, yes, yes. and so it, like but it's not the you know what is really there is that cloud of potential that contains all things you know all is in all and i think that applies even at that fundamental physical level however i would say with the neoplatonists that the physical is suspended from the mental and that's where we i think must disagree, you know, <laughs> relative to your naturalism. And so maybe we could explore something like that more next time. Um, it, this also ties back into one argument that I um, it briefly kind of uh, intimated at in our first discussion about the immortality of the soul. Mm -hmm. So I've used this argument of the um, indefiniteness of indiscernibles to in combination with IIT and Tegmark's mathematical multiverse, because uh, I, I am a mathematical realist. I think we need the mathematicals out there. Yes, and, yes. I, I do agree with that, of course, yes. And, and I think that implies in many worlds. So the, the upshot of it, though, is that we, you know, as we experience a death, we are one finite, you know, semi-mathematical system in an infinite sea of possibility. And the matter there is it contains all of the possible transformations that may occur, not in space and time sequentially exclusively, but what are the intelligible structures that can move through a, a seek like a, a principle of sufficient reason abiding sequence, you know, like IIT talks about the causal repertoire, but their concept of causality is just like the association of states. And these are eidetic structures and these are mathematical structures. And so that's kind of where I situate, the the soul and uh, like our the core of our life and i would say that's prior to space time and then we'd have to get into like the the question that we got at almost at the end of the last conversation about there's so much that i'd love to talk to you about <laughs> i'd like to like drive up to toronto and talk to you for five hours that i could but um yeah this idea we just began to scratch the surface of which is like the emergence of body and the role of measurement and the role of consciousness in that. And uh, so that's kind of how I, I I view it. The mathematicals are eternal and real. Therefore, the soul is real because the soul is of the nature of the ma mathematicals, like Iamblichus says in on uh, the general science of mathematics. So we are this kind of eternal eidetic structure. We are akin to the forms in that way. And we give rise to body in our energizing. Not us directly, because we're also tied to the world soul. And I think that has a real psychic uh, substance, just like we do. Um, so there has to be a correspondence between us and the world soul. It's not like pure solipsism, where like the physical world is my projection. It's our mutual projection led by like the great um, mother. So <laughs> I want that five words, John. I want this summarized. <laughs> And answered in about you know maybe eight <laughs> words. We'll give you a couple extra words. No, well, first of all, I, I mean I appreciated the you know the uh, the reinterpretation of matter and kind of the uh, the divinization of matter. Um, I mean this we're wrestling with stuff that was at the end of the Middle Ages, right? When and this the problem of individuation was exactly the problem that sort of brought down Neoplatonism and ushered in nominalism. Um, because you individuation and I mean Spinoza makes this point and Hegel needs this makes this point and this is what I didn't quite hear in the proposal 
Uh, individuation needs this capacity, which we then regarded as the actuality of matter, which is resistance. Uh, to individuate is I, I, I have to be able to resist, right? Uh, right. Uh, I have to be able to hold things out, out of the out of the time and space. I'll put those in quotes because they're precisely what's in question. But out of the time and the space that I'm in, you know. And Spinoza has the no notion of kinetis. And and I and that's what became the primary right and right matter was resistance and, and the resistance is what allows for the individuation, and and so for me, um, I think there's truth in that. I think that uh, matter isn't purely privative. It has if it is the principle of individual. I agree with what happened. I just disagree with the what the nominalists concluded about this. I think we had to, if we're going to have a principle of individuation, it has to have what, you know, Hegel talked about as, you know, negative determination. It has to have the, that fundamental ability to resist, to hold things out from it. Uh, uh, so, because if, if everything interbleeds, you don't get inter, inter, you don't get individuation anymore. You get interpenetration. And the, of course, and this is, this was a problem, as you know, for you know, Neoplatonism is how are the forms different from each other in the intellect? Because they completely mirror and interpenetrate each other. Um, and, and so I think I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Uh, I think uh, we'd have to talk about it more. And so um, uh, I'm happy for you to go over what you, you said again, especially the matter part. But I do think there's something right to the idea that matter is... Um, as that kind of superpositioning of potentiality like you described, I think that's right. And I think that reaches into the quantum in really cool ways. I like that. But I do think matter also has, right, it has an actuality of resistance that is what is required for it to be able to perform individuation. Um, and I think that's an important thing too. And I think that is a proper part of, right, um, trying to explain like emergence upward um, in an important way. Mm. Uh, now, does that necessarily reify matter then? And would you then need to have a form of matter to specify what it is that has this resisting potential? Because I, I would feel comfortable just placing that resistance in the very most basic formal property that can occupy that potentiality. Right. And there's even a notion like this that kind of sounds like quantum foam, again, in the Theotetus, where uh, they talk about like before you have definite body, you have kind of like a, a pulling apart, swirling like capacity for form that's more than pure uh, privation. It's not nothing, but it's not quite, you know, a, a particular body yet. So, but then that's, yeah, above like matter itself. I would say that resistance could very well have to do with that very like uh, vague and ambiguous and mysterious notion from the Theotetus that there is some kind of intermediary between body and and matter, which is pure potential. Well, even even the notion of the Kora, the receptacle, uh, implies resistance, right? It, it, things can't be like it, 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 if 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 you like if I want to receive if I want to be a receptacle for something, I have to be it has to be able to be held by me if we're if the notion is going to have any sort of meaning which me if it if it could if it if if there's no resistance or there's no receptacle um so well, I would, what about I the would, way that the one contains all things but that's a, precisely the point uh, right. which goes back to your point before the the the, the one contains all things in, an, in in a way in which they do not have any individuation whatsoever that's what makes it the one right um, and and that and that and that's the problem with the forms, right? It's like, well, the forms are well, how are they different from like and what people like and mm -hmm. Plotinus uses staple, he uses spatial metaphors. Oh, it's different. Like, no, no, <laughs> that doesn't work, right? Um, you you mm -hmm. because you, you know you can you can think like think about all the forms. I could do some compression function on them so that I got the one form or something like that, and then there isn't a there isn't a fundamental principle of individuation. Hmm. I, I would think of the difference of the forms, just to throw this out there, as like the difference between colors or the difference between different timbres in musical tones, where it's like different uh, spectral analysis that you could draw of it. Each contains all the you know frequency ranges, but in diff different proportions. Um, 
but yeah, I know you're out of time and we could keep going, but, um, yeah, yeah cause I, uh, uh, they all, they're, they're also different in what is waving in the waves, right? Um, there's electromagnetism versus sound and air. And so that's part of it too. Uh, and then, then I would bring in the resistance and matter is what allows waves to exist. And so, yeah, but we could do this. We could keep going back and forth. Um, I, I, I and, um, I want to do that. So I'm not trying to, uh, jump ship. Uh, but I do have to actually go. We're we're at my absolute uh, limit, um, yeah, Eric. This is this is. I think we uh, we got the best of both the first and the second uh, discussions into this, and we got into genuine dialogos in a really good way. Yeah, you know, we. I think we were really sparking off of each other. So I wanted to thank you for that. Yeah, just like the other times, leaves me wanting more, and uh, I am willing to drive up to Toronto if you want to talk for five hours anytime. <laughs> just let me know. <laughs> well, we, you know, I, I'll probably take you up on that when I can block off five hours for people <laughs> other than my romantic partner and my kids uh, and my friends. Uh, I'm spread very thin right now, um, and and I have people like Robert who are trying to alleviate that, and so hopefully there will be some more flexibility in my schedule. Uh, I would love to do that. It would be great if the three of us could all get together, in fact, in person. I'd like that a lot. Yeah, that'd be awesome. You're very generous with your time. Appreciate it, John. Uh, uh, Eric, you, you know, and, and and this is not meant to be in any way condescending. Like it's you're worth it. Like you're you're sharp and you're quick in, in the good sense. And 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 you have like you have both a comprehensive and a sophisticated grasp of this material. And it's good to, I mean, you and I are ultimately from the same side of the tracks with with respect to most of the culture. And so I find working with you really, really valuable. I introduced Eric to Rick and Rick was like the same thing. He was like, oh, you must be a professor somewhere because of your grasp on all of this technical knowledge, your capacity to deploy it in really interesting, meaningful ways and these kind of couldn't be higher level conversations. Yes, yeah, so I love bringing the two of you together as well. And I like I, I even in this hour, I don't think I, I was like just noticing the joy of listening to the whole thing. And I was like, oh, this is delightful. If I just listen more. I'm going to be happier. Like I'm going to experience more joy <laughs> as I listen. And and I think you're just confirming that, John, and what you're saying and, and how you're complimenting Eric, which I think it's equally sincere. Yeah, I, I enjoy uh eric's wit and warmth and intelligence so much and uh yeah thank both of you i've got a jump so yeah. thank you very much and we'll talk again uh plato aristotle socrates and you consider yourself a disciple of plato he feeds our mind body and soul